In this video, we are going to do the proof of the theorem that I alluded to in class, which I'll put up right here and then say out loud. Let's suppose that G is an element of a permutation group, so we'll say that it's a finite permutation. Then the order of that element G is the least common multiple of the sizes of, or the cycle lengths, that appear when you take that element and write it in its disjoint cycle notation. So that's only huge strengths of writing. A function is as a disjoint, um, as a product of disjoint cycles, so you can determine its order very quickly. Now just as with any time you're going to try and prove a theorem, one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you thoroughly understand all of the definitions that appear in that theorem, uh, or all of the lemmas that you may need to use. So one of the definitions that we need to make sure that we're familiar with is the definition of the order of an element. So we're going to need, it has two parts, and we're going to need both parts in order to do the proof of this theorem properly. So the definition of an order of an element, if G is an element of a group, then a natural number n is the order of that element G, if each of the following holds. So two things. First of all, it has to be the case that when you take G and raise it to the nth power, that you get the identity of the group, whatever that may be. Um, but more importantly, this has to be the first time that this really happens, uh, other than the silly example when you take something to the zeroth power, which is why we make n be a natural number. That is, we need it to be the case that when you take G to the k, and you raise it to a power, that you do not get the identity if k is a natural number that happens to be less than n. So that n is the smallest positive integer for which g to the n is equal to e. Now let's begin the proof of the theorem, and before we really get started, we want to introduce some notation to make our life a little bit easier. We want to talk about the direction we're going to take with this proof, and we want to make any type of sort of general observations that we might use, you know, carrying on throughout the proof. So the first, let's start with the notation. Let's take G. We do want to write it as a product of a bunch of cycles. So let's write it as C1, C2, all the way out through C sub M, C for cycle. So we take the element G and write it as M cycles, C1 through CM. Uh, and these cycles are going to be assumed to be disjoint cycles. And we're going to be talking about two different integers here. We're going to be talking about the least common multiple of the cycle lengths that we have, and we're also going to be talking about the order of G. So let's introduce two different letters. Let's introduce K for the least common multiple of the orders of the C sub i's. Remember, the order of an M cycle is just the number of things in it, so this is also this is synonymous with the lengths of those cycles. And let's introduce the letter N to denote the order of the element G. With this notation in mind, the structure of the proof is going to be a very common one. We're going to first show that n is less than or equal to k, and then we'll do a separate proof showing that k is less than or equal to n. And if both of those, inequali uh, both of those you know, inequalities are going to hold, then the only way for them to both hold is for n and k to be equal, which is the statement of the theorem. So last, before we really dive into the proof, is I want to make a couple of observations. The first is something we discussed in class, which is that disjoint cycles commute. So each of these cycles is disjoint, um, so it doesn't matter the order in which you do them. We saw this in class with an activity where we were sort of colored um, according to different colors, and I said, does it matter if I swap the green people first or the or the pink people first? Um, and it didn't seem to matter, it didn't affect, because the people who were green and the people who were pink were totally separate from one another, uh, and in the end they were both cycled the same way. So that's this result that we commonly say, disjoint cycles commute. And one of the great things about exponentials is that when we have elements that commute, like C1, C2, all the way out through Cm, these are disjoint cycles, they commute, and so what this means is that if I'm taking any integer power of the product of them inside my group, I can distribute that lth power to each of the individual cycles. I can't do that in general in an arbitrary group, but if I happen to have this additional extra information that the elements that I'm raising to the power commute, then I do get this, this special law of exponentiation. So that is in, t in play for me here. When I take g and I raise it to the lth power, because g is equal to c1 through cm, when I raise that to the lth power, I do get to distribute that l to each piece, and so I have this equation g to the lth power is c1 to the l times c2 to the l all the way out through times cm to the l. 
My next observation is something that we will see a lot as we go on in group theory, but this is all pretty new, so I wanted to state it here explicitly. Let's suppose that, let's get away from the notation of this specific problem and just say if sigma is a permutation, or any old group element for that matter, and if the order of that group element is r, and l happens to be a multiple of r, what that means is we can write l as r times something else, times some other integer s, then when you take that group element and raise it to the lth power, that is equal to, by substituting rs for l, that group element may raise to the rs power, and by our rules of exponentiation, this is equal to the group element raised to the r, all raised to the s power. Now, because r happens to be the order of here sigma, but any old group element g will work, because of this, when we take that group element and raise it to the r, we're getting the identity. That's property one of our definition of the order of something. And when you raise the identity to any old power in the world, you still get the identity. So in summary, if you had a element of a group, here we're working with permutation groups, so our element is sigma. If its order is r and you raise it to a power which is a multiple of its order, you're going to get the identity. And that's true always, permutation groups or any group, but here we're applying it to permutation groups. Now, we're ready to go on in our proof. Remember, we're showing two inequalities. Let's show the first inequality. Let's first show that n, remember n is the order of g, is less than or equal to k, which is the least common multiple of the orders of the c sub i's. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use our first observation. We're going to take g and raise it to the kth power. That's equal to c1 times c2 all the way through cm being raised to the kth power. And using our first observation, the c sub i's are disjoint. This means that those elements commute, and we can distribute that power. So g to the k, right, we're just applying that general observation we had on the previous slide with the integer l equal to this specific integer k. So g to the k is equal to c1 to the k, c2 to the k, all the way out through cm to the k. Now, Let's take a look closer at one of these pieces that's over here on the right-hand side. Choose some sort of i, where i is in the right range to be a subscript, and let's take a look at c sub i raised to the kth power. k is the least common multiple of the orders of the c sub i's. In particular, it's a multiple of the order of c sub i. So when we take a look at something like c sub i raised to the kth power, we know we're going to get the identity, and that's by that second observation on the previous page. And this argument is totally independent of the letter i, or the number i, I guess I should say. Um, we picked i arbitrary in this range from 1 to m, and we saw that this holds c sub i to the k is equal to the identity. Therefore, it's true for all of them. So c sub 1 to the k is the identity, c sub 2 to the k is the identity, all the way and so on out through c sub m to the k is the identity. So if each one of these things is equal to the identity, identity times identity times identity all the way through times identity, then this whole right-hand side of the equation is equal to the identity, and we conclude that g to the k is the identity. Now, going back to our definition of order, we've just shown that g to the k power is equal to the identity. Now, remember that n is the order of g, and n is the smallest positive integer with the property that g to the n is equal to the identity based on this definition of order. And if n is the smallest integer with this power, and k is some integer with this power, then n is going to have to be less than or equal to k. And that concludes this first direction of showing that n is less than or equal to k. Now, uh, let's show the other inequality. This should actually say not that k is not equal to n. That's definitely not what we're trying to show. We're trying to show the opposite of that, k, that k is equal to n. But what we want to show is that k is less than or equal to n. So this not equal should be a less than or equal to. That's my fault here. And this direction is going to start the same way as the previous direction. Let's take g, and instead of raising it to the kth power, like we did in the last direction, let's take g and raise it to the nth power. Again, let's use that first observation to realize that g to the n, which is c1, c2, all the way out through cm to the n, is equal to g to the n, g to the n is equal to c1 to the n, c2 to the n, and so on and so forth. 
Because n is the order of g, we can apply that first property of n being the order of g and conclude that this g to the n over here is actually equal to the identity. And by transitivity, we conclude that c1 raised to the nth composed with c2 raised to the nth all the way out through cn m raised to the nth power. That giant function composition is equal to the identity function composition. And now what we want to claim, what we claim is true, is that each of the c sub i is raised to the nth power is the identity. Now this is not necessarily automatic. It's very easy to take long strings of compositions and get the identity without each of the individual pieces being the identity, but we're claiming that that's actually what's going on here. That each one of these individual functions, ci to the n, is equal to the identity, and that's something that's going to require us um, to do a proof of. So for now, let's fix i. Let's fix i to be arbitrary in this range between 1 and m, and let's show that it's true for this arbitrary c sub i raised to the nth power that it's the identity function, meaning right, this is a permutation group. These c sub i's are permuting something. If x is a value that's being permuted, uh, what we want to show is that c sub i raised to the n of x is equal to x. So that's what it means to be the identity function. Okay, So let's let x be a member of the domain of these c sub i's. It's one of these things that's being permuted. We're inside permutation groups. Now, let's think about two different cases here. First, one case is that x is not a value that's mentioned by c sub i. So c sub i is a permutation, it's just a shuffling, it's taking things and moving them around. If x is not mentioned, then that means x isn't moving. It's just something that stays put, which is what we want it to do. Then c sub i of x is equal to x. Uh, and if we start taking powers of c sub i, take c sub i and square it, take c sub i and cube it, that's just going to affect the things that are being moved. It's not going to affect the things that are staying put. They'll just continue to stay put through each power of that element. Mm, the second case is that x is a value that's mentioned by c sub i, and this case is understandably going to be a little bit harder. But here again, we're going to use the fact that these cycles are disjoint. So if x is one of the things that's being moved around by c sub i, then if I look at any of the other c sub j, for j in the right range and j not equal to i, then those c sub j's cannot mention x because c sub i mentions x, and these are disjoint cycles. In fact, this is true not just for x, but for of all members that are mentioned in c sub i. And if something's mentioned in c sub i, it'll be, it may be mentioned in a power of c sub i, and, it, and this will also be true for the other powers of c sub j. So if x is something that's mentioned in c sub i, then it should be mentioned in the powers of c sub i, possibly, maybe not, but it certainly won't be mentioned in c sub j or in any other power of c sub j. We conclude from this that Let's say that c sub i to the n of x is equal to y. If c sub i to the n of x is equal to y, then y is something that's mentioned by c sub i or c sub i to the n. Uh, and so y cannot be mentioned in c sub j, nor can y be mentioned in c sub j to the n, if j is a number that's different from i in the right sort of range. What we conclude from this is that whatever y is, sorry, let me go back there, whatever y is, if I take a look at what y is, y for c sub j is going to be one of these cases. y is a value not mentioned in c sub j. So c sub j of y would be equal to y, and consequently c sub j raised to the nth power. Doing that same function a bunch of times isn't going to change the fact that y is staying put. Um, and so c sub j raised to the nth of y will be equal to y whenever j is different from i. Right. Almost there. It follows that if c sub i raised to the nth of x is equal to y, then when we take a look at this giant composition, if we plug x into this giant composition of functions, we're going to get y out in the end. Why is that? Let's talk through that. x goes in to this function as an input, and it goes through c sub 1 to the n and c sub 2 to the n, and anything that isn't i, it goes through as x just as itself, x, 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 x. It stays x until it reaches c sub i to the n and c sub i to the n changes the x to a y. Then y is one of these values that's not mentioned by anything that comes after it. So y is what's going to go into the next function, and it's just going to stay y all the way through, y, 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 until we're done. 
So if c sub i to the n of x is equal to y, then when we put it into this elaborate uh, function composition, we're going to get the same output. However, remember all along that this elaborate function composition, c1 to the n, c2 to the n, and so on, is equal to g to the n, which is the identity function. So, which means that whatever we put in, which is the x, has to be the same thing that what comes out. So y must be equal to x. And we conclude all along that c sub i to the n of x is equal to x, which is what we wanted. Now, i was arbitrary. I was in this range, just some sort of arbitrary thing that we cho chose in this range, and, and i was not important to our argument. So we conclude that c sub i raised to the nth is e for all i in this range, just as we wanted. What this implies is that the order of c sub i, I mean, for us, what this implies is that the order of each c sub i is less than or equal to n for each one of the c sub i's. The part that makes this proof a little difficult is because we you know, skipped chapter 4 in Galleon. We need something a little bit stronger than this to be true in order to finish the proof. What we need is we need for the order of c sub i not just to be less than or equal to n for each n, but to divide n for each i. And in fact, we have that. That's something that we're going to cover in chapter 4, but we haven't quite covered it, so you'll just have to take my word on it at this point. Right? The order of each one of these c sub i's divides n, because we're taking c sub i and raising it to the nth power and getting the identity, it actually follows that we have more than less than or equal to, we have division. And in this case, if we have that result, it's enough to get, get us what we want. If the order of c sub i divides n for each one of the i's, then n has to be a multiple of the order of c sub i for each i. Just rephrasing what that wording says. And if n is some multiple that's the order that, if n is a number that is a multiple of the orders of the c sub i's for each i, then the least common multiple of the orders of the c sub i's, which remember we're denoting by k, has to be less than or equal to this multiple. k is the smallest multiple with this property, n is a multiple with this property, so k has to be less than or equal to n. Once we've established both that n is less than or equal to k and k is less than or equal to n, we have the result uh, and we're finished.